going to start now with our uh, final session of the day, which is on a really important topic of fairness in clinical machine learning, uh, which we've also been uh, alluding to um, in a number of the, the, the talks and sessions earlier today. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our moderator for this session, uh, Dr. Kristen Yum, who's an associate professor of radiology at Stanford. Uh, Kristen, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank, thank you for joining us in our last session. Um, our session is called Fairness in Clinical Machine Learning, and we have uh, wonderful sp speakers lined up. And the first uh, speaker will be Dr. Rachel Thomas. Uh, Rachel is the founding director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the uh, University of San Francisco and co-founder of Fast AI, where she helped create the most popular free online course on deep learning, bringing people from around the world with diverse and non-traditional backgrounds into AI. Uh, she was selected by the Forbes as one of 20 incredible women in AI in 2017 and was profiled in the book, uh, Women Tech Founders on the Rise. She earned her PhD in mathematics at Duke University where she worked on mathematical analysis of biochemical networks. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, yeah, so I am... Um... Uh, as mentioned, I'm a director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at USF, um, and this is because I'm concerned about harms due to misuse of data, including algorithmic bias and issues around, around fairness. Um, I also really see the potential of machine learning, um, and in that capacity, Fast AI, um, where our, which is a nonprofit research lab with the goal of making deep learning more accessible to people in a variety of domains. We really want domain experts to be able to use state-of-the-art deep learning. We've had a number of radiologists take our course and are now contributing kind of cut, cutting edge work. Um, and I think we're at a really, really crucial point in time uh, where there's a lot of promise to be had for machine learning, but also a lot of potential risk and harms. And so we need to be careful about how we approach things. Um, and my goal, uh, my goal here is to, to help, uh, help widen and enlarge the conversation that we're having on, on fairness and bias, because we're often uh, kind of just talking about a narrow slice of the, the issues that are out there. The FDA issued guidelines last year on enhancing the diversity of clinical trial populations. Um, this is an incredibly important topic, and we've definitely kind of seen the harms of what happens if you, for instance, only have white men in your, in your trial. Um, and while, while this is important, it does not solve all our problems, however. Uh, so one example comes from Fitbits, uh, which are currently used in almost 300 clinical trials, and they provide you know, a cheap way to measure heart rate. However, Fitbits and other wearable fitness monitors primarily use a green light technology to track heart rate, which is less accurate on people of color. So the, the readings are kind of lower quality if you have more melanin in your skin. Um, and so this is, this is an issue where um, including people of color in your clinical trial, while important, um, is not going to address issues when the, the measurements are systematically biased, or at least uh, kind of biased towards being inaccurate. Another example comes from this paper from Zayed Obermeyer et al. that was published in Science last year and covered by Nature. And it looked at a algorithm that was in use um, in a real healthcare system impacting millions of people. And it was used to flag patients that were high risk and in need of extra support um, and extra care. And it was found to be biased against black patients. And here the training set had included white and black patients and the average healthcare expenditure of both groups was the same. The, the underlying issue arose because um, essentially the algorithm was using healthcare expenditure as a proxy for sickness levels However, on the whole, Black patients were receiving less health care for a given sickness level. And so using, using spending as a proxy had a very biased result. And fortunately, this is something that uh, was resolved by introducing a new, a new metric. Um, but this is a really common, common issue in that we, we're typically using proxies for the things that we really care about. Um, you know, we may not have uh, we may not have the measurements for what we uh, most care about, and we have to rely on billing codes or, or other, other proxies. And so these two examples of the uh, Fitbits, um, as well as this, you know, using a proxy, are both examples of measurement bias. And it's important to understand that they are different sources of bias because they require different interventions. 
So the, I think, example we hear about most is representation bias. And this is what happens in, uh, for instance, the study we heard about last month where uh, uh, the researchers looked at what happens if you train a CNN on chest X-rays from a group that's 100% male or 75% male. They also looked at the reverse 75% female or 100% female. And they found not surprisingly that a classifier trained on a really gender imbalanced data set of chest X-rays uh, resulted in a model that was less accurate for, for the other gender. A third type of bias that's really crucial to, to understand is historical bias. And historical bias is a fundamental structural issue with the first step of the data generation process and can exist even given perfect sampling and feature selection. Um, historical bias, I think, can also be referred to as systemic racism or systemic sexism, and it's very pervasive across, across society, across different fields. Uh, we hear about it a lot in the criminal justice system and algorithms built within the criminal justice system having, um, having very racially biased outputs because all the data is so, is so racially biased. Um, I've studied this in my own industry, in the tech industry, the way that, that bias shows up in hiring, in performance reviews, in promotions. Um, so, so medicine is no different. Uh, we see a lot of historical bias in, in medicine, and I'm not trying to pick on doctors or medicine because this is true of, of so many areas of society. Um, there's a, a wealth of research on this around uh, gender and racial disparities on who, uh, who receives pain medication, who receives prompt diagnoses. Um, I'll just share a few, a few takeaways uh, with you. A meta-analysis of 20 years of published research found that black patients were 22% less likely than whites to get any pain medication and 29% less likely to be treated with opioids. And this difference even extended to children with black children receiving less pain medication than white children for the same conditions. Research shows that doctors take the pain of women less seriously than the pain of men. And this shows up in prescribing less pain medication with longer delays and more often ascribing pain to psychogenic causes. And so there have been studies where um, patients report lower back pain and the same complaint if it's coming from a man is more likely to receive pain medication coming from a woman is more likely to receive antidepressants. And so I was, um, I was invited here, I believe, as a researcher in deep learning and in data ethics and algorithmic bias. However, there's another area where I have expertise, which is as a patient. Um, in the past five years, I've had brain surgery twice a life-threatening brain infection, and several hospital stays. Um, I'm just gonna share uh, one experience with you, which was in 2015, when, uh, when this all started, I had, I had no history of headaches, and I developed a really, really severe headache. It was the worst pain of my life. It lasted for several days. I didn't go to work. I was uh, trying you know, to stay in a dark room and not look at screens, uh, take over the counter medication, nothing, nothing was helping. And so I went to an ER, and after, after many hours, they, they dismissed me and they said, it's just a headache. They didn't run any tests. They told me to go home and take aspirin. Um, and that was, that was very devastating. And to, to feel that gap between what I was experiencing and what I could convince a healthcare worker I was experiencing. Um, fortunately, I went to a different ER a day or two later where they did an MRI. As soon as they got the results, they transferred me to the neuro ICU and I had brain surgery the next week. On the whole, I think I've had access to very excellent medical care, I'm very fortunate. Um, yet at the same time, I've had a number of very, uh, very discouraging experiences of being dismissed or disbelieved. Domain expertise is crucial for any applied machine learning project. And in medicine, this needs to include doctors and patients. And so I think we talk, a, talk more about the particular domain expertise which doctors have, which is incredibly valuable and important but patients have a unique and distinctive set of domain expertise as well. Um, and that includes both knowledge about what they are experiencing in their own bodies, as well as how to navigate the medical system from a patient's perspective, uh, which can be, can be quite challenging. And I think this often includes, includes information that is not captured in any electronic health record. Um, so another area where we see bias is diagnosis delays. On average, it takes five years and five doctors for patients with autoimmune diseases 
75% of whom are women to get a correct diagnosis. Diagnosis of Crohn's disease takes 12 months for men on average, 20 months for women. Diagnosis for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome takes four years for men and 16 years for women. And for many types of cancer, women have to make more visits to their general practitioner uh, before they are referred to a specialist. And so all this shows up in our data and it's crucial to understand these biases, to understand what's missing from our data, what's incomplete, what's incorrect. Um, you know, and, and in my story, I think about uh, all the MRIs that weren't, uh, you know, that aren't taken, the patients that don't, uh, don't persist and don't go to a, a second ER or a third ER or don't, uh, kind of don't have the, the resources to do so. Um, and all that, that is gonna show up in our data in various ways. And we have to understand, um, understand those factors. Furthermore, the, the medical system as a whole can be disempowering and even traumatic for many patients. Um, Aubrey Hirsch wrote a very powerful comic um, and I encourage you to look, at, look it up in full about um, her, her experience. Uh, she has Graves disease, but it took her six years to get a diagnosis. And by the time she did, she suffered permanent damage to her eyes, bones and heart um, because of the years that she went, went undiagnosed. Um, she talks about doctors dismissing her as, you know, her list of symptoms must just be due to anxiety. She writes, I knew my body and I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't get anyone to listen to me. Um, kind of so many doctors tell her that she's fine, that she begins to internalize that and to doubt herself, even if she's suffering severe symptoms. Um, she writes, I assumed that what happened to me was a fluke, that I had fallen through some crack in the system. But I've since learned that my experience was entirely typical. And so, um, so I think those are some perspectives that are important to understand about kind of the medical data itself, about how patients experience the medical system. Something that's important to understand from the machine learning perspective is that we're seeing, and we're seeing this, I would say, um, more so in fields outside of medicine um, right now, but that machine learning is often having the effect of further concentrating and centralizing power. Um, and this is often unintentional, but it's something that I think we really need to, to be wary of um, or conscious of in, in trying to avoid as, as we use machine learning more and more in medicine. Um, there's an algorithm that's used in many of the 50 states to determine Medicaid benefits. And when it was implemented in Arkansas, there was a bug in the software code that incorrectly Cut, uh, cut benefits for people with cerebral palsy, including Tammy Dobbs, who was interviewed in this Verge article. And so what happened is there was this drastic, kind of drastic cut in care for people with cerebral palsy. They couldn't get any explanation and there was no system of recourse in place because there was no system to identify or address mistakes. And fortunately this eventually surfaced um, after a lengthy court case, but that's really not, not the ideal approach. And this is, this is a common issue that we see with many, uh, many machine learning systems being implemented, uh, but not having, not having a system for recourse. Another issue in this case was that nobody, nobody wanted to take responsibility. The creator of the algorithm, who is, this is a proprietary black box algorithm that he's earning royalties off of. He said it wasn't his responsibility and he blamed the policymakers. The policymakers could blame the engineers that implemented this. And I don't say this because uh, it's not that casting blame is important. It's that we need to have a notion of responsibility to ensure better outcomes. And this is not unique to machine learning systems. This is common in all bureaucracies, but as Dana Boyd has observed, algorithmic systems are often extending bureaucracy right now. Um, and so some of the ways that ML can have the effect of centralizing power, of course, it does not always is that it can be used at massive scale very cheaply. It can replicate identical biases or errors at scale. While humans are certainly very biased, as I, as I showed earlier, um, at least there's variation across the population. ML can be used to evade responsibility, can be implemented with no system for recourse. It can create feedback loops and a feedback loop occurs when, whenever you're no longer just observing the data, but when the output from your model influences what the next round of data looks like. And it can amplify, not just encode bias. Um, and so it's good to be conscious, conscious of these risks. Um, 
Fortunately, there's been some really, really positive work happening in the machine learning community um, towards moving our, uh, our conversation uh, beyond just fairness, which is important, but expanding it to, to talk about power and participation as well. Uh, Dr. Sinit Gabru, um, who got her PhD here at Stanford, is one of the foremost experts on this topic. And she wrote in the New York Times, a lot of times people are talking about bias in the sense of equalizing performance across groups. Oops. They're not thinking about the underlying foundation, whether a task should exist in the first place, who creates it, who will deploy it on which population, who owns the data, and how is it used? Um, and these are really, really crucial questions to be asking. Ria Kaluri uh, wrote a great article in Nature last month, um, encouraging us to move from asking, is this AI fair, to asking, how does this AI shift power? And just a few weeks ago, one of the major academic machine learning conferences, ICML, was held. And there was a fantastic work workshop on participatory approaches to machine learning. And there, they talked about moving beyond uh, kind of narrow definitions of predictive accuracy to trying to think more about holistic good decision making in complex real world cases. Moving beyond transparency to contestability, uh, because what good is transparency if you can't critique or contest uh, the decisions that, a, that an algorithm is making. And moving from explainability to recourse. Again, how can, how can those who are impacted by, by a system, uh, what sort of actions can they take to get uh, kind of changes to, to the outputs? And so I was very excited to see this work. I encourage you to check it out. I think it's available, uh, available online, the papers and talks. Um, you need to listen to patients to understand the ways that their data is incomplete, incorrect, and biased. Um, I don't think this is something that you can understand apart from talking, talking to patients. Um, you also need to listen to patients to understand the ways the medical system is disempowering. And so we can uh, hopefully avoid having machine learning contribute to that. So I want to challenge, um, challenge all of you to think about what would it look like to include patients in all stages of your process and to do this in, um, in meaningful ways that are not just participation washing. And I'm gonna close with a quote from AI researcher, Deborah Raji. She wrote, data are not bricks to be stacked, oil to be drilled, gold to be mined, opportunities to be harvested. Data are humans to be seen, maybe loved, hopefully taken care of. Um, and she was writing in the context of COVID-19 data. Um, however, I believe this is true of all medical data and many, many other types of data as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for the excellent talk. We will now move to our next speaker, um, Donald Martin. He is um, currently a technical program manager and social impact technology strategist at Google. He focuses on driving innovation in the spaces where Google's products and services intersect with society, as well as understanding the intersections between trust and safety, machine learning fairness, and ethical artificial intelligence. He holds a degree in electrical engineering from University of Colorado at Denver and has founded its uh, National Society of Black Engineers chapter over 25 years ago. Donald has over 30 years of technology leadership experience in the telecommunications and information technology industries. He has held CIO, CTO, COO, VP of IT and product manager positions at global software and development companies and telecommunication service providers. He holds US utility patent for problem modeling in resource optimization. His most recent publication is Participatory Problem Formulation for Fair Machine Learning Through Community-Based System Dynamics. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Kristen. Let me just share my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see that. Everyone can see that, hopefully. Good, okay. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk about upgrading the product development process to foster ML fairness and ethical AI. And I wanna start off with this quote from the 2017 AI Now report that reads, producing technologies that work within complex social realities and existing systems requires understanding social, legal, and ethical context. Now that understanding is hard to come by as I'm sure you can imagine. 
And when we don't have that understanding, it leads to this kind of problem. Uh, Rachel was just talking about this use, use case a few minutes ago. And this has recently discovered racial bias in a medical algorithm that's widely used throughout the US healthcare system. And the goal of the system that the algorithm that was, was a part of was to identify patients with the most complex healthcare needs so that they could be given access to special programs. The idea is that this would, would reduce the cost in the overall healthcare system. But unfortunately, people not selected for the special programs by the algorithm suffer from nearly 50,000 more chronic diseases than those who were selected. Additionally, the people not selected were disproportionately African-American. This is why the algorithm was deemed to be racially biased. So what happened? The researchers who studied the algorithm identified that the root cause of the failure was the target variable selection decision that took place during the problem formulation process. Now problem formulation takes place in the early stages of product development. It's highlighted in this blue phase on this diagram. But when we do work to mitigate bias in ML systems, we typically focus on that middle phase, ML system design and development. And we focus on data selection and collection, model architecture selection and design, and model training and evaluation. But the failure of this algorithm reveals that high stakes decisions made earlier can have devastating downstream impacts. Now, when we drill into the decisions made there, we see things like what problems should we solve and what are the relevant factors? Who are the target users? What are their needs? How will we measure success? So let's think about how we make decisions as humans for a couple of minutes. We leverage causal inference capabilities to make decisions. And our causal inferences are shaped by strong top-down prior knowledge in the form of intuitive theories. So in some work that I've done with folks from DeepMind and Google AI, we call these intuitive theories causal theories because of their, of their linkage to causal inferences. Now let's take a look at what role causal theories played in the failure of this particular algorithm. So as a reminder, the ML problem was to select patients with the most complex healthcare needs for special programs. So the engineers made the causal assumption that complex healthcare needs would lead to increased spending on healthcare. That was the causal theory that was used. And that led to spending on healthcare being chosen as the target variable for the algorithm. So why was this problematic? This is problematic because it, this causal theory excludes critical factors that, that impact how much African-Americans spend on healthcare, independent of their healthcare needs. Additionally, the African-American community didn't participate in form, formulating this causal theory. If they had, it's not a stretch to imagine that they would have identified key factors such as underdiagnosis due to bias, lack of trust in the healthcare system, wealth and income disparities, and lack of access to affordable healthcare, all as factors that, that decrease spending on healthcare in the African American community independent of healthcare need. Now taken together, those key factors represent a subset of the structural inequities that exist in the, in the US healthcare system. And those structural inequities actually in increase the amount of complex healthcare need that exists in the African American community. And this has been borne out by COVID-19. We're seeing disproportionate rates of death uh, in the African American community because of these structural, in structural inequities. Now, these causal theories of key stakeholders of this problem domain are key to understanding societal context. But even in this diagram, I'm oversimplifying what it takes to represent societal context because Societal contexts are dynamically complex systems in and of themselves um, that are constantly changing in nonlinear ways due to inherent time delays and feedback loops between factors. And so if we wanna to try to solve this problem of incomplete causal theories leading to problematic proxy choices, we have to contend with that characteristic. Now, our recommended solution is to introduce a formal and explicit problem understanding and formulation subprocess to the traditional product development process. And it should be optimized to elicit, synthesize, and make explicit the causal theories of target and non-target stakeholders. It should center the perspectives of the communities most vulnerable to algorithmic bias in participatory and non-extractive ways. And it needs to be able to contend with the dynamically complex nature of the societal context in which products will be deployed. Now we've identified community-based system dynamics as a promising practice to operationalize this new subprocess. Community-based system dynamics, or CBSD, is a participatory practice for including communities in the process of developing a shared understanding of complex problems from the dynamic feedback perspective. CBSD leverages visual tools and simulation 
to support groups in the co-development of explicit and transparent causal theories. Now, I'm just gonna flash up an image that depicts the notation that's used in system dynamics to make causal theories explicit. I don't have time to walk through it in detail, but this notation is optimized for capturing the dynamically complex nature of societal context. Now, we spent some time actually training people in community-based system dynamics, and we've discovered that regardless of educational background or lived experience background, people are able to grasp these, grasp these concepts and apply them fairly rapidly. Now, to summarize, we contend that participatory problem understanding and formulation will be an important practice for mitigating algorithmic bias. And CBSC is a promising approach for operationalizing, operationalizing it. And this is why we want to spend time doing some case studies and pilots to test the efficacy of CBSD in product development, as well as to identify the constraints of practicing CBSD in corporate environments, and most importantly, in partnership with communities. So thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Okay, next speaker is uh, Judy Gochoya. She's an assistant professor in interventional radiology and informatics and imaging sciences. Um, at Emory University. She's an active member of uh, the Winship Cancer Institute. Dr. Gachoya earned her medical degree from Moy University in Kenya. She completed her medical internship at Kiambu District University and earned Master's of Science in Health Informatics from Indiana University, um, Purdue University in Indianapolis. In addition, she completed postdoctoral training in informatics at Rangan Strip Institute in Indianapolis and a residency in diagnostic radiology at Indiana University. Prior to arriving at Emory, she completed a fellowship in interventional radiology at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Judy. Thank you so much. Um, this is really, really tough to follow all these amazing talks at the end of the day. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I chose this topic of data autopsy for fair medical AI, and really, as, as you'll see all of us uh, with the two previous speakers, uh, that we have the same sort of feel around uh, some of the work that can be done. It's the, um, so, um, no conflict of interest in, re in relation to my presentation today. I have a little bit of service to the radiology societies. And so, uh, I think it's clear from the previous speakers that this is a common, uh, this is a problem of um, bias within uh, not just radiology, but medical AI. Uh, one of the earliest papers was done by John Zack, who uh, looked at variable generalization performance of a deep learning mo model uh, for chest radiographs. And, you know, they used uh, a data set, one, two data sets, that are in the, actually all data sets are in the public domain and realized that when the distribution of the disease was equal, which was in this case was pneumonia, then the performance was sustained. But when that was shifted, then they, they developed uh, differences in uh, model performance. And so they also realized that the deep learning models were learning uh, some of the characteristics of the radiographs. For example, you know, the labeling, which would identify where this a radiograph came from. And obviously, if you're coming from the ICU and you're getting a morning portable, then even any radiologist would know that this is a high chance of pneumonia. And so we, they started this, you know, they're the, probably the earliest group to document some of these uh, findings. And, you know, surprisingly is that this persists in our work around uh, COVID inference and performance of some of the top performing models uh, right now. And uh, these are free for you to read and test. We notice uh, a very high false positive uh, rate with one model and a very high false negative rate with the other model, rendering these systems pretty much useless because you have to either look for the cases that were missed or the cases that were overcalled. We test it across different open um, public data sets and identify that the models learn very, very well what are support devices. And these usually include chest tubes. Uh, sometimes it's just the EKG leads that are uh, placed on the patient and start to overfit because they use those as a proxy again, that you're in the ICU and you most likely have this uh, disease. The other places, uh, you know, 
uh, we sort of find this is actually online. This is a tweet that was uh, last month, actually in June, where uh, some were saying, you know, I'm, I'm swam during weekend call. And, and, and this really just spoke to me because uh, this was a system that you can clearly tell that this is a system in use uh, right now. And, you know, he, you know, he says this is epic failures of computer system diagnosis. Uh, it's picking up, you know, a strict artifact, you know, uh, calling that this is a bleed. Uh, just because this is a, a quality of imaging that a radiologist can easily identify, but completely missed the bleed that was on this patient in a different area. And then in this different case here for a brain uh, a CT, it has a big, big area of hemorrhage, but this uh, AI you know, tool started to say, you know, uh, you cannot revascularize this patient because they're having a stroke. And I mean, just very, those sentences when they say that they, they may sound intelligent, but they really don't mean anything and are actually dangerous and can cause harm. And so uh, when I thought sort of in our work, and that's what I want to share, is how are we dissecting and, you know, performing these data autopsies to help us uh, understand how AI performs and also prevent harms. And so uh, this paper has been reviewed by the two previous speakers. I'm not going to spend time on it. It's a fantastic paper. You should Really. And one of the earliest people that you can see, this is from 2017, um, Luke, who's a radiologist from Australia, uh, spent some time exploring the chest X-ray 14 data set and, and highlight some pro problems. And if you look at the uh, three uh, public data set, one is uh, text part, then the NIH data set and the MIMIC chest X-ray data set, they still persist with uh, more than 90% of these labels uh, because the way we label uh, medical uh, imaging is by proxy. And it really sometimes misses the visual findings, this uh, visual analysis, which is super important for exploring uh, what are the findings, because we have to remember that the radiology report remains a communication between a radiologist and a referring doctor. And so uh, despite all this work and, and, you know, appreciative that, you know, that self-publishing is sort of possible uh, for us to highlight some of these roles. And you can see some of this, his work made it into, you know, a paper actually this year where he explores this large public data set and, and highlights this is a, a data set showing that there's pneumothorax, but he really highlights uh, some of the things that, uh, that these cases, uh, especially in the green boxes, were cases that the patient has already been treated with a chest ray. And, you know, while this may be an, a, a task that's done by AI, uh, what's important is what's uh, missed, you know, missed pneumothoraxes, new, missed pneumothoraxes that are not treated, because then that has potential for causing uh, uh, harm when if you already have a chest tube, which is a small tube that's used to drain the pneumothorax, which means air around the lining of the lung, then this is uh, something that's already been taken care of. So even in one label, there's relative importance of uh, some of the characteristics and this sort of visual analysis really is super important. And, and also, uh, you, he also describes the Mura data set, which is a, a radiograph data set, and, and contrast, you know, contrast sort of like the labeling pattern and the labeling style and um, how that was important and difference in terms of quality. And, you know, in, in response to the first case that I showed from Twitter, uh, you know, uh, this company, which I actually didn't know what the name of the company, unless they had, if they hadn't replied, you know, say, you know, the aspect as, as you know, application which just tells you, can you revascularize the patient is supposed to give you a score in the presence of a large volume occlusion, a large vessel occlusion, and it's not designed to find hemorrhages. And our, this other module has FDA clearance to notify uh, physicians of suspicion of hemorrhages as, you know, as small as this level. And, and so this is for me a problem because I don't need to run 50 algorithms to tell me every single pixel and how it's supposed to you to affect me. And we really don't have the resources to explore this uh, together. And so I find a clear disconnect between the data set development, you know, the process of data set gathering, cleaning and labeling and usage because uh, the connection 
uh, between a medical image and its label requires context and domain understanding. And so the disconnect can uh, cause accuracy of labels to be overestimated, while the presence of unlabeled objects that look different from the majority of images in the labeled class can alter the usefulness of labels for training. And um, if you sort of see this, uh, you know, Im not imbalance, but just sort of, uh, I think we have to shift really from, uh, you know, just training and uh, looking at inference and how we can create utility and understand uh, the bias. And so, uh, you know, everyone knows about ImageNet and the advances that it was used uh, for computer vision techniques. And I think there has been frequent calls for developing a medical equivalent of an ImageNet. And even with that, you can see that labeling is still a problem. This is a recent paper uh, that looks at the performance just based on the labeling style uh, when the when new architectures are introduced. And so, you know, these authors uh, develop like reassessed labels to evaluate the progress and, um, and, and realize that some of the previous work, uh, some of the previous model of a fit, uh, you know, the idiocracies of the uh, labeling pipeline. And so in our group, what we are trying to do one is to provide just the basic pillars. Uh, every night we get 350 uh, gigabytes of medical imaging uh, from uh, 72 scanners in our enterprise and are starting to fetch out metadata and index them to allow us for dynamic cohort creation and querying that allows domain experts to further explore uh, the performance of machine learning. Because honestly, there's no formula. And, and, and you know, unlike where it's predicting a, a cat or a dog, uh, it, it's not just one class and the, the performance and the and sort of the practice keeps changing. Uh, in our funded work from the NSF, we're trying to figure out instead of having this you know, the radiologist is working alone and the machine learning is working alone, but we've created this and exploring what are techniques for creating an assemblage that both people can learn together uh, where the radiologist, for example, looks at an X-ray, the machine learning adds to their visualization and the radiologist adjusts or ignores and they makes their final interpretation and how this can fit into continuous learning uh, for both humans and, um, machines. And I think everyone, especially with the release of GPT-3, uh, you know, appreciates the, the progress that transformer models have made. But we don't look at them from a perspective of training, but as, as a perspective of, com of extracting semantic uh, interpretations that can help us uh, have a better visualization into uh, better understanding into black boxes. Because as, as you had earlier today, the saliency maps for medical imaging are really not useful unfortunately for the domain experts. And so um, one other uh, area and a collaboration with a fantastic group from India is this idea of visualization of data. And, and because you have to lower the bar and the anxiety for domain experts to participate in machine learning. We're a pilot center for uh, um, the ACR AI lab, which is allows federated uh, learning on different institution data sets, but we see this as a potential for us to work on uh, almost federated validation and what that means. And to end my talk, um, really, uh, we don't develop these tools in isolation. We understand that there is a trust uh, social need for social transparency, value tensions, you know, regarding payment and consequences that must be considered as we start to design these systems and understand what experts use them. So I call to action, you know, to help us develop more tooling. I think of more dissemination avenues uh, to peer reviewed, you know, uh, articles uh, beyond blog posts. I I'm not saying they're not adequate, but they, I think we need to disseminate and make it okay to discuss failure. Uh, think about consequences, especially for uh, around proprietary software where they may have received FDA approval and really collaborate to make uh, medical AI safer. I stand on the shoulders of Jan and I really thank my team uh, here. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for the great talk. Our next speaker is Nigam Shah. Uh, Dr. Shah is an associate professor in, of medicine and biomedical informatics at Stanford University and serves as the associate CIO for data science for Stanford Healthcare. 
His research focuses on combining machine learning and prior knowledge in medical ontologies to enable the learning health system. He was elected into the American College of Medical Informatics in 2015 and is inducted into the American Society for Clinical Investigation in 2016. He holds an MBBS from Baroda Medical College in India, a PhD from Penn State, and completed postdoctoral training at Stanford University. Welcome, Nigam. Thank you. I think you might have read out the, the most accurate biography of my, of my degrees. Uh, I don't know where you got hold of it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, usually I just go by Nigam. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to try to convince you about, some, or at least put some uh, quantitative uh, uh, estimates around the different issues that our previous speakers have already brought up in this session. And I call this the price of fairness, uh, it, you know, a little bit of uh, a tongue in cheek and uh, the practical empirical characterization of algorithmic fairness for clinical risk prediction models, which is a URL to a paper that I'll share uh, during the talk. So Starting with acknowledgments, uh, this is the team that makes it all happen. The uh, two people circled in red are the ones who did the research. Uh, one of them I know is, uh, is on the live stream, uh, Stephen Fole. Uh, he's the one in the front row. And the uh, funding that keeps uh, all of this. Uh, so we've been talking about risk prediction and fairness quite a bit across this conference. Uh, and so I'm not going to go too much into the details here. The, the, the big point I want to make is that risk prediction, and I put prediction in sneer quotes because it's sometimes it's classification, but it's masquerading as prediction. It's often used to decide whether to act or not. So we saw a few imaging examples. I have one around a simple one, the ASCVD risk scoring. Uh, Ziad's work was already mentioned, impact pro algorithm for being high cost and the issues in using a wrong surrogate label and so on. So there's Something like 250,000 publications for clinical risk scoring uh, in uh, that's 2015. And since 2015 to now, God knows how many that is, uh, definitely more than 300,000, I would imagine. And algorithms leading to unfairness are often a topic in the media. And there was this huge outcry after Ziad's paper uh, and you know, on a periodic cadence, a new algorithm is found to be systematically biased and there's, a, a, there's an outcry around it. But what I want to focus on is the separation between these two core issues when we talk about fairness. There is one thing to strive for absence of systematic error in the estimate of a chosen outcome. So the probability uh, that uh, someone will have a cardiovascular event or so on and how you find them, which is the choice of the label. And then there is the related issue of having an absence in systematic error in assignment of some benefit, the enrollment into some risk reduction program, the prescription of a drug or what have you. And I would submit to you that usually the outrage we feel is because of a systematic error in the assignment of the benefit. And the assumption and often unstated is that if we fix the systematic error in the estimate of the outcome or the biases in the labels and so on, that will fix the systematic error in benefit assignment. And I think uh, uh, two of our speakers have already alluded that uh, that might be a little bit visual thinking unless we understand the causal pathways or the assumptions that we're making, we may or may not get there. So it's not that much of a, uh, of a convincing after uh, having this nice intros. So there's this notion of algorithmic fairness. Uh, you can think about it at the group level or the individual level. I'm not going to talk about the individual level because it's very hard to formalize, formalize that. Uh, at the group level, the, the general idea is to prevent systematic error in the probability estimate given some protected attribute like age or sex or, or race or ethnicity. And there's some common constructs such as demographic parity in your model's output or equalized odds, equal opportunity, having equal calibration. Each of these different constructs capture some different intuition about what it means uh, to be fair. And then 
there are the criteria that declare the mathematical formalism that tells you which quantity should you equalize for your model to be considered fit according to that given construct. And then a corresponding metric that would tell us how much or to what extent has the fairness criteria be satisfied. And there's a the huge body of literature around all of these things. Uh, I'm just establishing a framework that I'll use uh, in, in the next slide. So this is the experiment that we did, this empirical characterization. Uh, on the left is we have a few data sets. So we use three data sets. Then we define between three to five outcomes on a particular data set. And then for those outcomes, there might be the sensitive attributes. So in this case, for the 30 day readmission, there is sex, race and ethnicity and age group are the, the sensitive attributes. And then we have the model performance metrics, which is how good or bad the model is in terms of its predictive accuracy. The fairness metrics that tell us how fair, to what extent have we accomplished fairness. The columns would be the criteria by which we assess fairness. And we had five performance metrics, eight fairness criteria, and six, uh, eight fairness metrics and six fairness criteria. So if I showed you the full figures, uh, it would be, you know, for a given data set, for a given outcome, you would see two panels with six columns and five or eight rows, which would be too much to put on a PowerPoint slide. So we're gonna zoom into a smaller uh, fraction of that. And this particular URL, which is the title, uh, has the details uh, of the, the empirical experiment that I just laid out. So on the right of this screen right now is, are the fairness metrics. So those are the rows and the columns are the uh, criteria by which we uh, accomplish fairness. So the three columns are, we will be penalizing the difference in mean predictions across groups. We can do that penalization condition on outcomes or just conditioned on uh, the, or just within the positive class. So those are the three columns. Uh, we're looking at 30-day uh, uh, readmissions in, uh, the, in one of the data sets, the star data sets, and uh, the sensitive attributes being race in this case. For each panel, the x-axis going left to right is the degree to which you're jacking up your penalty, uh, you know, for in case the panel uh, penalizing the differences in mean across groups, for example. And then the rows are telling us to what extent uh, we're being successful or not. So the good news, which I'll just highlight in a second, is that these, these uh, uh, approaches are, seem to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. So if you look at the fairness metric of mean difference amongst the predictions by groups, and you're penalizing having a difference in the mean prediction, and as you jack up the penalty, the differences in means go away. That's, the, that's this uh, uh, upper left uh, uh, blue box. And the other two similar like that. Okay, so that's the good news. The bad news is when we look at the performance metrics and the columns are still the same, we're applying the same kinds of penalties and from left to right, the penalty is going up. But now we're looking at AUROC, the average precision and the average calibration errors. And as you can see, as we go from left to right, uh, the Average precision and AUROC drops as we start penalizing these various quantities. And then average calibration, if we're penalizing differences in means across groups, conditioning on outcomes or within the positive class, we get out of calibration really fast. So essentially we're making the model systematically worse, mostly for everybody, except for these few rare cases uh, where my mouse cursor is, where the orange line is going above the dash lines. The dash lines are the best you can do for a group. And so above that is good, below that is bad for the first two plots. So where do we go from here? So the bottom line, at least when we looked at all of these metrics across all of these outcomes, uh, not only are we seeing this behavior, but the behavior is also quite unstable and depends on the definition of your outcome and the particular data set that you use. So that's the other piece of bad news. And so what we think is, and uh, as the prior speakers have alluded to, like we need a broader vocabulary for fairness. And these metrics are typically evaluated in a prediction setting using some older observational data. 
and we do not know why we observe the differences across groups. And uh, you know, our, our second speaker talked about uh, the need for having some causal model in the back of your head. And we also do not know the effect of the model guided interventions on the benefit accrued, which is the systematic error we want to fix. So more at this URL. And I'll close with sort of our current thoughts, which are not that contrarian anymore given the conversation, is that we need to incorporate perspectives from diverse stakeholders at the design stage. So that's been said like three times already. Uh, and we should probably be using fairness metrics for auditing rather than optimizing specifically against one formulation or another, or for one formulation or another. And then I think we need to worry more about the effects of the policies and the interventions that are being done based on these models rather than the predictive performance per se of a fair or a regularly trained model. Uh, so I think that with that, I'll close. Uh, and I think that's the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Nigam. Our final speaker is Jonathan Chen, who leads a research group that seeks to empower individuals with collective experience of many combining human and artificial intelligence approaches that will deliver better health care, either uh, together than alone. Dr. Chen continues to practice medicine for the concrete rewards of caring for real people and to inspire this research focusing on discovering and distributing the latent knowledge embedded in clinical data. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Yam, for the introduction and all for the great um, setup with all the prior speakers. Um, you know, my background is actually in software engineering and computer science grounded in logic and deduction. So when I went through my medical training, it quite surprised me by how much undesirable variability and uncertainty there is in medicine. If you're ever sticking a tusk case, you really better ask for a second opinion. Well, that got me thinking, you know, maybe couldn't you instead empower individuals with the collective experience of thousands of others? This potential wisdom of the crowd is actually non-intuitive to many people. There's mathematical theorems hundreds of years old for why this might work. It's the reason you would trust a jury over a judge. It's the reason we want voting democracies and not dictatorships. It's the reason why machine learning algorithms learn by mass example. But for just a fun example to inspire some thoughts about this, y'all remember, who wants to be a millionaire? TV game show, answer questions for big money. A classic thing in this show is if you get stuck, you can ask for a lifeline, phone a friend. What is this? You can call anybody in the world you want. You can consult a specialist who you think is going to pick the right answer. Alternatively, you can ask the audience. This is just taking a poll of the studio audience watching a TV show. So it turns out if you do this, if you call somebody, they're right a good 65% of the time, way better than random. But strange thing is that the majority vote of the audience is right more than 90% of the time. So there's a recurrent phenomena here that's demonstrated in multiple disciplines, including in medical decision making, which you can find in my research papers, and illustrates the potential power of this phenomenon. There's a whole weight reason why we think machine learning on data can work. But it also gets you to think about learning from humans. Is that always good? I mean, what could possibly go wrong? It's a very colorful example. Microsoft released a chatbot onto Twitter and uh, was demonstrating the potential of naturalistic conversation out of an artificial agent. And it was designed to have this very quirky personality. Tay would say things like, I'm so stoked to meet you. Humans are just super cool. By the next morning, she says, chill out. I just hate everybody. Within a few hours, she says, I effing hate feminists. They should all die. Hitler was right. Holy smokes, what on earth is going on here? Now, appropriately, Microsoft probably shut this bot down and issued an apology, even though I'm quite confident that nobody programmed this bot to be a racist, misogynist jerk. But what did they do? Machine learning. They told this bot, go out onto the internet and just talk to people. Listen to the way they talk and incorporate their phrases into your own language model so you could become more human. You could become smarter, right? And if any of you have ever browsed through internet comment boards, um, well, you can easily imagine the results. This is really disturbing. And especially when you consider our first principle should be to do no harm, right? Well, maybe the easiest way to do no harm is just do nothing at all. In the next version of this chatbot, they just designed in to be deaf, mute, and blind to gender, race, religion, anything that could be controversial. This version of the bot just refuses to talk about it, will not even engage in the conversation. 
but it is going to be awfully hard to learn more about how to deal with, how to appreciate, how to change sensitive issues of fairness as we're discussing if we're not even allowed to talk about them. So I am skeptical that simply shutting down these symptoms or hiding this information from the algorithms is going to leave us much better off. Uh, another prominent news story recently, Amazon, they had an algorithm trying to automatically screen resumes for job applicants they wanted to hire. They eventually just scrapped the whole project when they found that the algorithm was clearly overtly biased against women. So that's okay, but what disturbs me at that story, just stop there. The news cycle, just stop there. You can turn off that algorithm. It, it, all that algorithm did was emulate your underlying hiring practices. It's not enough to just end there. If anything, the algorithm was useful in that it exposed, it made plain the underlying structural biases in the underlying system. This study has been cited multiple times now, so I won't uh, re-labor it, belabor it too much, but the health insurance, trying to find people to offer more help to with all best intentions and yet bias. Regulators come in, investigating the company. Why are you guys making this bad racist algorithm? I'll offer my hot takes here in addition to the excellent points already made that I don't think it was an algorithm problem. It was a target problem. It was a data problem. And in turn, it really wasn't a data fault. The data was just a record of human history, a human history that reflects underlying structural issues and the inequitable distribution and access to healthcare and resources. So ultimately, these are just examples to really illustrate how algorithms, models, they are amplifying tools. They will make us better at doing whatever it is we are already doing. So if we look at AI and machine learning systems and we sometimes don't like what we're seeing, consider that they may simply be mirrors reflecting ourselves, the practices and values that we demonstrate and not necessarily the ones that we aspire to. With that in mind, the mantra I prefer to practice by is, of course, I'm going to aspire to do no harm, but I'm going to do that in the context of always trying to do the most good. And I'll pass it back to the speaker. Thank you, everyone, for this excellent talk. Uh, we learned a lot about fairness today, bias, um, issues that relate to shift in power, uh, need for transparency, and uh, ex you know explainability, and uh, you know how we can really um, uh, you know uh, we really need to look at uh, intrinsic biases that we may not even you know be aware of. Um, I have some questions from the audience, and uh, maybe. Um, the panel members can help uh, illuminate on some of these uh, questions. Um, one question is, when will artificial intelligence be available to serve population that are most in need and resource poor? Um, because if these systems are more available to the, those who have access, what about the, the ones who are resource poor? What is missing to gain scale? Um, and the comment being, these technologies seem a far cry from the poorest population. Um, maybe uh, any of the speakers might want to take a stab at this. Uh, I'll take a quick stab. This is um, Dr. Chen. Um, with all historical technological advances, the other point of fairness we didn't talk as much about is um, briefly, it's the concentration of wealth and power, right? The fact that we don't all have to work on farms, like that's a good thing that a couple percent of the population has the technology with automation to produce more than enough food for all of us. We are all better off as a result. The democratization of digital technology will ultimately make us all better off. However, it almost ex always exacerbates in existing inequities. Those who are under pressure tend to get pressured even more so. So we're not going to stop that shift if we should be aware of its oncoming nature and how it may not play out in the way we necessarily aspire to. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, this question is for Judy. Um, as you're a radiologist also and an AI scientist, um, earlier it was mentioned um, that um, a product, uh, that usability would be important. Um, and so what do you think, what are some of the ways that we can do this and especially, uh, you know, given the diversity in socioeconomic conditions and people in various places around the world have different needs. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a very, very hard question, honestly. And one, there's just the, the end user, uh, 
you know, design experience uh, for the user. And some of the, the work that we're doing actually shows us interesting things, which is um, that uh, there are some of the social cues that are inherent in this data set and the AI algorithms that we work on. So for example, the paper we worked on, uh, on sort of like this social technical of angle of explainability was looked at, if I'm in the emergency room and I have this 100 uh, studies to read, so you can imagine those like you have 100 to do things and all of a sudden you have, uh, you the administrator says, you know, if you read these two studies, I'm going to give you a higher score. You know, so that's called the RVU in medicine. And so what happens is that if you now start to AI flags that these are some maybe some some studies without findings, then all of a sudden I could start to get inherent and associate that, well, if I do this task A, it's going to have a higher weighting. So I'm going to claim that for myself. So it brings a new complexity of gaming that may be hidden just from designing just a, a UI and figuring out uh, what's going on. Another example for this is that if you're in a training institution, uh, as the train, you know, as the trainer, you may decide I'm going to read the easy studies because they don't have a very high yield for learning for my trainees. But if AI starts to flag those as reserved or they need a bigger agency, then those become very difficult uh, for you to, for us to train the next generation of radiologists. And, or in some cases that a normal study, a negative study needs to be read quickly to allow the throughput of the emergency room to, so that other patients can come in. So this, you know, that's how I think uh, in terms of design of the system should be human-centered explainable AI and uh, design of the systems. In terms of uh, different socioeconomic status, I, you know, I truly believe this is a very, very hard question to answer because the problem is when we go to new communities, as someone who's lived uh, in both uh, worlds, we assume we know what the communities we go to need. And that has to be the place where you stop. You, you have to be, to hold yourself to a higher standard. Uh, we know that the laws are, are lax there. They don't have an FDA to vet, you know, vet your application. And that can uh, cause even amplify uh, problems. I know that the, the previous studies have shown that uh, the, the quality of care you receive is worse than receiving no care at all in some of these places. And so uh, I think the second one is a complex issue. Maybe we can tackle it in one of the upcoming webinars uh, with Stanford Amy. Thank you, Judy. And Donald, maybe you can help us with this question. One of the audience members asks, um, should people and companies benefiting from democratized data have a moral obligation to provide their algorithms and AI products uh, democratically? Um, any thoughts? I mean, one thing I would say in this area is that um, we've, been, we make, we've been making a lot of progress on democratizing the ability to create AI. Um, but I think we need to make some progress in democratizing the, the ability to actually, uh, you know, understand the impact of AI. Um, and particularly right now, there's a, I think there's a lack of balance and power in terms of the people that actually get to model the world. Um, and we're giving people lots of tools to do that. And uh, so de democratizing the ability to actually participate in modeling the world, I think is, is one thing that I think is super important. And I think that starts with in, in, the, in this problem understanding stage, uh, because that's where, that's where we're kind of, uh, kind of reflecting our views of how the world works. And then we kind of realize those in the, in the target variable selections we make and the data sets that we choose. But, but having, enabling people that aren't computer scientists and others to kind of participate in the early stages of like, how do we model the world? How does it work? What are the real problems that matter? What are the factors? I think that's what we should focus on, on democratizing now so we can kind of balance this power out. Thank you. Um, and finally, I think we have um, time for one more question. And um, Rachel, I, I was hoping you could, you could help address this one. And uh, I think we really enjoyed um, listening to the biases that even in medicine, if you're a male, maybe you get labored with a certain disease, or if you're a female, maybe people jump at a certain diagnosis without um, really thinking, even amongst the physicians. Uh, one of the speaker or uh, audience members asks, um, can, can you comment on how we may avoid perpetuation of uh, bias, whether it's conscious bias or unconscious bias 
in AI systems and uh, uh, in healthcare. Yeah, and I mean that's a very, very deep uh, question because I do believe that we have to we have to address the bias in our human systems as well. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to leapfrog over human bias to get to some uh, uh, de-biased um, AI. And it, it is important to recognize that all data sets are biased and key things are understanding the, the context in which your data set was created, um, kind of who made the decisions, who's maintaining it, what was included, what was not included, and what context is it appropriate to be used. Um, so I think though that there's not, um, um, well, it's good to be a, aware of how we're, how we're encoding bias in, in machine learning. There's also, there's not gonna be a shortcut. There's not like the mathematical transformation that's just gonna, gonna solve everything when we have these very deep, you know, centuries old problems um, that, that, you know, that continue to show up in, in medicine and, and throughout society. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think we are out of time and I'll um, kick it back to Matt and Serena. Uh, thank you again to uh, to our our speakers and our moderator from the, the last session. Um, I think it was a, a fantastic session, and um, you know, lots of uh, re really insightful uh, thoughts and then perspectives about uh, you know really important questions. Um, so uh, that's that's a wrap for today. Um, so you know, we we had a, an absolute blast today, and really want to thank all of you for for attending and for your incredible engagement uh, with today's event. And um, you know, there were so many great questions and, and comments uh, in in the chats. Um, and we also want to thank all of our moderators and terrific speakers today uh, for taking the time uh, out out from their busy lives to be here with us and to share their insights. Um, and I also want to particularly uh, thank Joanna Kim, uh, Stephanie Bogdan, Jacqueline Thomas, uh, Katie Pontius, and Ashley Williams for all of their hard work in coordinating and arranging this event. Um, and, and the fact that this whole thing didn't uh, completely crash on us uh, was, was not just a miracle. Um, it was really amazing planning by their team uh, who made all of this possible. Um, so thank you to, to all of you. Yeah, thanks, Serena. I also want to definitely thank the symposium committee members, uh, Akshay Chaudhry, Daniel Rubin, who served along with uh, both me and Serena, all the incredible moderators and speakers. Again, thank you for, uh, for everything today. This was a great, a great day, lots of great comments uh, and discussions. We will be posting the recordings on our Amy YouTube channel, just another reminder, so please stay tuned. You can subscribe now. Uh, you won't miss anything. You can rewatch things if you want. Uh, there were also a lot of questions from all of you that we just couldn't get to. Uh, I think we had over 200 comments. And so we will be using those questions for our ongoing Amy series, uh, including the AI Happy Hour, uh, which again, you'll find on our channel. Uh, we'll also be inviting some of the speakers uh, today back uh, to join us at this happy hour. So, so please stay tuned for that to, uh, to interact with us even more. Um, and then finally, uh, we'd love to keep this great interdisciplinary conversation going. That was the whole point of today is to kind of launch this more formally. Uh, so all year long, we're going to have programs uh, via Amy that uh, are built around journal clubs and other kinds of events, um, which will be held bi-monthly, open to everybody, and feature interviews and presentations uh, by authors of great papers. Uh, and it'll be great to discuss with all of you again uh, going forward. So thank you again for, for, for joining us, and it's been a terrific day. Uh, okay, that's a wrap. Uh, thank you again, everyone, and we will see you all next year. Goodbye.